welcome to our uh, webinar on a very hot topic. How can you apply generative AI in the in service management? So before we begin, and while we're waiting for more people to join, um, I would like to ask you a few questions. One of those, uh, does your organization already use Gen AI? And if yes, uh, where have you already implemented it? And if no, then simply tell us which service management platform are you using? Uh, at the end of the session, we will have a little Q&A. So uh, during the webinar, feel free to ask your questions and then we will try to answer them at the end of the webinar. Uh, also, uh, by the end, you will get a GenAI use case map to see where it can be implemented in your particular business. Um, like I said, while we're waiting for more people to join and while you're answering the questions, let me give you a short introduction. So my name is Yegor and I'm an associate consultant at Teva System, a global boutique IT company specializing in GenAI and service management. And our primary focus is on ServiceNow, but we pride ourselves on being at the forefront of the modern AI revolution. Uh, while our expertise extends way beyond service management, today we'll delve into applying specifically Gen AI within this realm. We'll discuss the main concerns and challenges involved, as well as strategies for overcoming them. And additionally, we'll explore a few use cases and share some real world customer success stories. So today I see a growing demand from corporates to optimize their daily operations using AI. Starting as a novelty thing, it became a vital part of a successful business. So for instance, just yesterday, I read an article on how Electrolux drastically reduced resolution time from three weeks to just one hour. So that's how they sum up the difference between traditional event management and integrated AI operations. So as you can see, AI is a very powerful tool with basically unlimited potential, but there are still certain fears and lack of trust that prevent it from being widely implemented. In order to resolve these concerns, I invited not one, but two Teva Systems co-founders, Alex, who is responsible for the US market, and Kostya, who is managing Europe's DACH region. They are both experts in service management and will share their deep insights on applying generative AI in the corporate sphere. Well, welcome aboard, guys, and uh, can you please give us a quick introduction on your background, your field of interest? Um, Alex, you can go first. Thank you, Igor. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your interest in this topic. So my name is Alexey Klimenko. I'm a partner at Teva Systems and, um, as Igor mentioned, focus on U.S. and North American market. So I'm a self-assured entrepreneur. So all my life I've been building companies. Uh, I had several startups. And in fact, I work uh, in, you know, I, I founded two startups that actually use generative AI heavily for the past few years. So my expertise uh, lies in big, large enterprise software systems, uh, where I focus on service management. And, but at the same time, for the past, I would say six plus years, I've been using, I've been working heavily in the AI field and specifically in that natural language processing and understanding. And for the past, like, I'll say two years has been mostly generative AI. And so I will bring a different perspective to this uh, conversation today because I more come from uh, from the user of AI. Actually, like I, I have two kind of roles. I know both sides, but mostly I applied AI for building products that solve specific customer problems. And uh, so you can think of me as an on the AI consumer side. So thank you. Thank you, Alex and uh, Kostya. Take it away. Maybe Kostya, you can tell a bit more about your background and your interests. Yeah, for sure. So um, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, I have a quite a long journey in the professional services and implementation of service management and operation operation solutions, uh, specifically in the service now sphere, things uh, since already 13 years. 
I did implementations myself as a technical consultant, led teams uh, for global rollouts, had a typical implementation in IT service management, IT operation management, SecOps, et cetera, for mm -hmm. clients in Germany and across globe. Um, and I actually see organization getting better and better and more efficient and more automated, but still there are so many, uh, so much space and improvements um, in becoming more efficient, especially when it comes to manual tasks, manual activities. And this is where the generative AI brings the value most uh, from the day one. So that's great to be here in this discussion and share our expertise, our experience, and also uh, having the fruitful discussions with you guys and with the participants. Thank you, Kostya. So guys, as you can see, we have two experts in AI field and also we have uh, results of our uh, little poll. Um, so from what I can see, 60% of you already uh, implemented Gen AI in their business and also 67% of you are using ServiceNow. So this information is for you, Alex and Kostya, so uh, we know our audience a little bit better. And before we uh, proceed with our main topic, as a warm-up, guys, um, um, can we can we talk a bit? Costa, for instance, a question for you. Can we talk about uh, major takeaways from uh, the last year related to enterprise Gen AI? Yeah, the, the last year was basically a year of um, you know all the proof of concepts, proof of values playing around with the uh, the solutions, AI solutions out there, establishing um, own small language models, uh, but still it was just a playground from my experience. And um, I see the, the, the challenge is now, uh, I can transition from, from the playground into the real use cases. Um, the, the biggest challenges were uh, specifically in understanding of uh, what are the use cases for um, for particular organizations in in generative AI? Uh, what are implications uh, in terms of uh, security compliance, uh, but also um, um, implementing and getting the value from from uh, Gen AI? Okay, I see. So the last year was kind of still. Uh, like a like a playground for AI, like trying trials and errors. But Alex, what um, what are the major trends in two thousand twenty four? So <laughs> it's interesting. Like twenty twenty three in general, uh, it was a wake up call for a lot of organizations. So a lot of organizations thought, "Wow, uh, there's technology. What do we do uh, with that?" And they and a lot of actual enterprise companies I've spoken to, they already started thinking about what do I do with that, how to apply that, and uh, but it was like more like okay, this is here. What should we do about that? So 2024 is a year where companies have to show uh, like the first success stories, and it's not just because they want to do that because their competitors do. So we uh, we know several companies that are very concerned about how AI can um, disrupt their, their own business and not from the inside even, but also from the competition. So competitive angle is a big one for them. And another big trend that we see in 2024 is where the companies, especially enterprises, uh, come to is carefully evaluating where they can apply this technology. And when asked is, where do you apply this technology, uh, these capabilities, um, our main answer is always the same. And uh, you have to think about, you know, think of that not as a gimmick, but how can you solve mundane, boring tasks within your organizations? These are the isolated quick wins that uh, can result in huge, uh, huge outcomes. So, and uh, we, we see a trend that companies start evaluating different use cases within their organizations and tying them to the ROIs because a clear ROI uh, for this technology is very important. Uh, you know, it's not about technologists like playing with some tech toys, which a lot of us still do. Actually, 2023, a lot of did. Uh, but right now is how can you uh, connect it to business outcomes? How can you uh, create a solution that will increase the revenue? Or how can you uh, create a solution that uh, will decrease the risks or decrease your operating expenses? 
But uh, there's a big consensus for this year is uh, practical implementation and really focusing on solving mundane. Uh, you know, there's a saying like, where is the mud, there's brass. So uh, this is kind of uh, the trend that we believe. And again, competitive competitors, everyone is doing that. So so if you're not doing that, <laughs> it means that some of the competitors are already doing it. So you better think twice before okay, dismissing the trend. So basically what you're saying that uh, in 2024, uh, implementing using AI will define a successful business with unsuccessful. I would say successful implementation of mm -hmm. AI where it's, it's it's tactically or strategically important. Mm -hmm. So you have to be smart at applying that. So just oh. applying ev everywhere will not yield results, but coming to this as a thoughtful data data driven approach is very important. Okay, I see. Uh, well, thank you, guys. Then let's move uh, basically to the, our main topic, our Gen AI in uh, specifically service management. And um, question to you, Kostya, as an architect, uh, maybe you can um, give us some specific, maybe couple of use cases, especially in service management, where Gen AI will be the most useful. So the company will benefit the most after implementing Gen AI. Yeah, the, there is actually a, quite a broad spectrum where you can apply AI, uh, very useful. Um, you can think of, you know, ITIL, all the fri frameworks like ITIL, IT, uh, for, for IT, um, it organizes and structures the processes, define the roles. So you can streamline your organization, but still there are a lot of manual work to do. Um, so where agents um, involved, managers have to make decisions, uh, read uh, content, write content, all these um, all these activities uh, can be automated, and of course uh, it makes sense to review specifically th this um, uh, this use cases. Just just an example um, of from from previous where we had a situation where a client has quite a low maturity of the service catalog and the employees or uh, the, uh, the the users uh, on the other side have quite a long uh, quite a low understanding of IT and technology uh, so mm -hmm. basically they are just users mm -hmm. and not really aware of the IT and how the things work together plus the service desk of, of the client has a relatively low capacity so this combination is actually a root cause or was the root cause of very very low uh, first content resolution rate. And they also had a way too long resolution times and bad perception of the support quality. Uh, so why? Because the, the, uh, the, um, um, the, the users that came to the service desk mm -hmm. because they had issues, they sent it via email or raised an issue through the, uh, the service portal. And due to the lack of understanding of the issue and the uh, description that they provide, um, the agent would need to, to open it, to ask question again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you specify more, mm -hmm. more exactly what was the root? What, uh, what is the issue? Can you send the, the screenshot? So, uh, you know, this back and forth in, in the first touch point with your ser service desk, uh, it's quite long time to, um, so agent can start work on the issue. Mm -hmm. um, so we resulted quite simply, we created so-called AI-driven assistants and they reacted in the initial request within seconds. So when a user submitted the request, they, uh, the AI assistant analyzes the request, it has access to the user record, to the assigned assets, location of the user, and then this AI bot can ask questions related to users' assets that are assigned to the users. Uh, something specific to the application that the user um, uh, users like Outlook or whatever, and then asks to provide screenshots. So means um, because it, it happens within seconds, the user responds and enriches the initial request more. So as soon as a real agent pickups the ticket, uh, it is already everything in place. So almost so eighty percent of information that is required is already provided. So that means at the result, the ticket duration time is improved by two, three times. Wow. Yeah, so it's a very, very big improvement with just a small adjustment. 
Uh, of course, uh, you need time to, to analyze, mm -hmm. to solve the issue, but you at least can shorten the, the initial step by two, three times. And it's, it was a big impact. Wow. So, um, yeah, I, I, what I can see, yeah, it's just a, such a small tweak uh, leads to such a big impact. And it's only, you mentioned only one case. So I wonder if you implement more bigger case on a bigger scale, how much of an impact can it uh, cause on, on the business? And uh, Alex, maybe from, from your first perspective, as, as you said, as more of a AI uh, user, may, maybe you can give us some, uh, some also some use cases or uh, real life examples, maybe some customer uh, satisfaction story. So uh, yes, um, absolutely. So as I mentioned, we the, the AI is just a tool to be used to solve mm -hmm. real business problems. And uh, in my own companies, uh, we use them. I'll, I'll give a couple of examples, but uh, but also like the, I'll give later maybe kind of a blueprint of use cases that we have seen. Uh, that solves like that solve real problems in the business. So, and actually, after the webinar, we'll send the uh, this I don't know like blueprint uh, document where you can see the use case that we have seen that really have some great results. But um, I can give you like there like, there are two categories of use cases actually that we see. First one is like very low hanging fruits. So, uh, and this is uh, this use case actually are. No, normally backed by the platform. So if we talk about like, uh, let's say platform like ServiceNow or Salesforce or SAP, and I see a lot of respondents um, actually use uh, ServiceNow. So these platforms are very careful at approaching the Gen AI use cases because the, you know, the focus and they want to make sure it's done in the best possible way. And they usually start with uh, what uh, ticket-based uh, um, use cases. So it's about, as Costa mentioned, how to improve the uh, resolution time, how to reduce the first response time of a ticket. And uh, like specific functions, specific uh, features, uh, like summarization of uh, uh, of tickets, like you, like a ticket agent, service agent can uh, spend like up to 20 times less time reading through the ticket, that's summarization. Content mm -hmm. generation, when you actually use your accumulated tickets to generate uh, the uh, the knowledge by ba knowledge base articles or to create work uh, work notes again speeding up remember what i said mundane work just re reducing this work that doesn't have to be done so people can be reallocated pick, uh, for something use more useful to, people can do more tickets at this given amount of time uh, also but if we're talking about platforms it's the code generation it's uh, kind of uh, interesting uh, use case depending on the platform, uh, but uh, come back to service management. Um, obviously, the goal of service management is to reduce the amount of uh, tickets that exist and mm -hmm. to, to improve user satisfaction. So, self service uh, AI chatbots, uh, like for ordering, question answering within the organization, uh, and in, even like we've seen like in human resources. So, like if a person goes on the, on parental leave. So they want to know what what it means and how and so on. So usually in the past, HR was like it's hard to get this information. Right now, you can actually type in and say, "Hey, I'm going to parental leave. leave. What should I do? What should I know?" And this can be an already automated using these uh, agents, uh, conversational agents. Mm -hmm. A lot of and uh, that combines with a lot of search. Search uh, in the large organizations, search is a big problem. Finding the right information and not wasting time on looking for this information is a big, big use case. So this and use case I mentioned, these are some. Uh, these are implemented, for example, in ServiceNow with their new uh, Pro Plus platform, generic capabilities. These are the main core use cases that uh, a lot of customers are benefiting. But there are use cases that actually go beyond um, the this well, low hanging fruits, and uh, this is what I personally focus in uh, my business is that. Uh, for example, uh, compliance automation. So uh, one of the use cases is that um, our customers are a lot of oil and gas utility energy companies. And for them, uh, the most important thing is staying compliant because uh, federal and state regulators allow them to operate. Uh, and that means that they allow them to make money. If they're not compliant, they'll take away this uh, privilege. And uh, that's, that's going to be a disaster. So for them... Complying with all these regulations is a big pain, and they have all the de whole departments that try to cross-reference EPA regulations, for example, state regulations with permits that they receive when they install equipment and start production of energy, for example. So we built uh, AI uh, technology that actually 
uh, automates this compliance uh, uh, use cases. So uh, AI knows uh, about regulations and it's again you know, very tailored, fine-tuned on these legal documents and cross-reference mm -hmm. making sure that this knowledge is uh, like perfect. And then you have uh, AI that can generate uh, compliance schedules. So again, if we're talking about the platform schedule tasks within, let's say, service now and assign them to the right people, assign them to the right time. So the, the, everything is under control. And also like talking to your compliance. So if you have like an incident, you, uh, you know, AI can cross-reference the uh, compliance documentation and say what needs to be done and what time, how, and what needs to be reported to whom and so on. And this can also be automated with the workflows. So that's something that we uh, right now use in the oil and gas industry and energy. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a game changer for that particular boring work. Again, they have teams wasting <laughs> hours or weeks in mm -hmm. uh, every compliance period to figure out. Another use case, as I mentioned, HR uh, is a, a different one. It's how do you measure your um, internal, uh, uh, that's another another product we build. How do you measure your employee experience? Or what are the issues they have? How do you understand what needs to be changed uh, to, to in order to improve retention and uh, like and build a better culture? But also, what are the risks that employees identify within your company? So we built AI product that uh, analyzes employee, uh, you know, feedback, employee communication, uh, and uh, you know, finds let's say risk patterns uh, that uh, you know if there's any HR related risks, if there are any risks related to the compliance to the uh, even IT infrastructure and informs and triggers mm -hmm. tickets within the organization that help uh, management to to preemptively solve the problem before it becomes a problem. So, mm -hmm. and and there are more use cases like document extraction of, inf of information that is from uh, let's say healthcare. It's a big a big big case. It's even the service now healthcare lifecycle management product. You have patient cases. But how do you extract the data so you can create more and more useful analytics? How do you mm -hmm. uh, how do you search for this data? So uh, extracting data from a structure to structure is very important. So yeah, there are many more use cases that we can discuss. And again, we're happy. And actually, we're thinking maybe starting a new podcast series where we can drill down to a specific use case. So mm -hmm. if you are interested in continuing this conversation, we can drill and talk for one podcast for each use case and mm -hmm. uh, the, the actual customer stories we, we've seen with that. Yes, yes, exactly. I see that the potential is unlimited and basically the also the amount of use cases is unlimited. But uh, so before, so you were talking about the real life cases, yes, yeah, successful businesses, but uh, what I see now, a big problem is uh, the data quality. So before you start implementing AI, uh, is there some kind of a way to check whether a business is actually suitable or will the business benefit actually from implementing AI? Uh, Alex, maybe you can start on that. Yeah, that's, uh, yes, data is part of that, obviously. Uh, a good, great thing that was generative AI, that the importance of a huge amount of data is not as uh, as um, as critical as the quality of data. So that's just a small remark. But in general, yes, you have, as I mentioned, in order to figure out where you can apply uh, Gen AI the most, even using the platforms that you're using, uh, you need to come up uh, with a data-driven approach. And uh, while well, we were like, like, trying to consult, to, to talk to people and decide for ourselves where to apply it. We created um, an approach where we, uh, even though we create an application that, uh, that does that uh, analysis for us, is to look, uh, let's go to back to service management, is to look into the data that mm -hmm. uh, you already have accumulated. So mm -hmm. let's go back to the case management, customer case management. So uh, are you using customer service management systems or software, let's say like ServiceNow or even Zendesk or what, what not? How many tickets you have? What's your what's your volume? Uh, what's the, uh, how many people you have? What's your reopen rate? What's your first time response rate? And other metrics. So we, uh, so you need to collect these metrics and then you need to, tie the metrics to ROI, because after all, as I mentioned, it's all about the business impact and specifically about ROI. For example, for the case management system, the ROI gonna be uh, likely is the reduction of effort by percentage of time, a reduction of uh, reopen rate of tickets and, mm -hmm. uh, and actually d direct costs that you can 
uh, reduced by applying uh, technology. And there are very simple formulas uh, that you can take the metrics that you collected from your existing operating tickets, for example, all your volume of data that you collected, uh, and uh, how, how you transform them given certain assumptions like such as like uh, how many time you spend on a ticket, what's your uh, like salary, hourly salary for agent, et cetera. And you can clearly make a connection between what you have from data perspective and what, what's the ROI going to be. And then you put like uh, how specific um, Gen AI use case can affect that. So for example, in, in ticket summarization, uh, what we did, like we, we did research and so it can save up, up to 20 times more time reading the tickets, like work notes, the incident notes, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and that, that clearly you can calculate the ROI. And what we did, we, we built even an app when we talk with the clients, we actually run this app inside the um, uh, you know, environment that collects this metrics and uh, using with, with, with tw tweaking some of the assumptions that we put in that. Uh, puts the ROI estimation, and then you prioritize what uh, what what each feature or use case of Gen AI can do for organization based on the data you already. And this is how you can clearly show that this use case can make this impact of business. And then the rest of the question is how you do that, and how you do that depends on how you operate. If you work in service now, for example, you can use the a new uh, Pro Plus uh, ticket summarization feature. Uh, if you work outside, you may be thinking about like making a hybrid or homegrown solution. But again, the, there are so plenty of tools at, um, at your and our disposal that mm -hmm. it's no longer a question of how, it's a question of what. <laughs> I understand. Well, it's quite quite uh, unique, but uh, from the other side, very logical approach. So there's some kind of a assessment framework, yes, and analytics business approach. So basically, you need to analyze um, the system, yeah, and what outcomes to expect, what uh, what benefits it will it will bring to your business. Um, well. Costa, uh, my next question will be to you. So we are, uh, so we just checked the system. Yeah. So let's say the implementing Gen AI will bring a ton of a value to your to your business. But um, speaking about the actual implementation, so the AI is uh, quite quite new technology and it's still growing, still evol evolving. Um, so the implementation probably is not easy. Uh, can you can you tell us what are those factors should be considered during the the initial implementation of AI in, into into your business? I would say one of the lessons learned from 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 the previous year is basically um, having fun implementing AI. Um, however, having fun fun is not everything. Um, you you have you have to have an approach in place. And before even you start extracting data, you, you have to have a clear vision what you need to achieve with this AI-driven project, with, mm -hmm. uh, what you expect from that. Um, I, I, would, I would suggest to, to start with this vision, putting down the expectations, um, selecting KPIs that you want to improve. Mm -hmm. So your organizational key performance indicators. You can take your SLAs as a starting point. So which service level do you offer to your employees or to your external clients? And then uh, see where do you have lags? Where are you over your expected SLAs? So th this would be first most valuable use cases that you can start implementing. And uh, the, the project itself or the implementation itself, it shouldn't be a big project. So start small mm -hmm. is the key here. Um, start with small steps. Uh, you have to test it. You have to test results. Then uh, come back, adopt, um, adopt your prompts, your use cases, data extraction, etc. And then again, iteratively improve your results. Uh, so th this is probably the uh, the most most important uh, takeaway from from the last year. Besides that, you, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't um, rely on AI fully mm -hmm. um, because, as you say, it's quite new. Uh, we have to uh, gather experiences with that. So you need a human in the middle. You have, you have to have experts who review the results 
also review all that ROI, you know, and uh, KPI improvement, but also the quality of the AI generated content and decisions, and then um, improve again iteratively. So th this is most important. As I said at the at the start, have fun. So mm -hmm. it's it's a new new area. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't uh, believe in that, if, if you don't really enjoy playing around, going beyond the zero shot, uh, making a short third step, mm -hmm. uh, then it would uh, have success. Okay, I see. Uh, but it basically, many clients, they, um, they want uh, quick results. Now uh, they they want to see uh, they they ask something for instance uh, chat chat GPT and it give them an instant answer. So how to deal with that in 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 business? Is there a way to actually um, show the client that AI will bring you um, result, bring value to the business and show them now, like you said, start small and grow bigger. So is there a way to uh, start small and to have already uh, impact on the on the business? Just, um, uh, you know, so... Yeah, as, as, as Alex, Alex said previously, we have this data-driven approach to, to mm -hmm. analyze the data existing mm -hmm. data, it's very important to, to, to see where you would have the most impact as soon as possible. So if you have a lot of tickets in your queue that you can automate, you can analyze, then it brings value from the day one. Uh, so th this is very important to analyze uh, this, uh, the environment of the customer mm -hmm. and then starting implementing it one by one, by one but also showing this, this result, the, the er ROI, Mm -hmm. uh, to to the management, to the clients, and also th this is another topic, although mm -hmm. you know, uh, gaining trust and adoption um, of the solution. Yeah, but um, start small, iterate, show results. This is what yeah the, the key key factors and key key learnings from the last year. Okay, I see. Well, Alex, maybe you from your own experience from uh, implementing AI and having so many successful business cases, maybe you can tell us what are the uh, what distinguishes successful AI implementation. So there are a couple of things, but again, if there is only one thing you take away from this webinar, uh, is just find the most mundane thing that uh, like that you can you can automate. Uh, and tie it to your the top line or bottom line of the, inside the company. That's the, the that's the blueprint that for successful uh, implementation. When it comes to the how things, there are a lot of ways how to you, how to, you can approach uh, building like successful um, in, implementing server and use case in an organization. Uh, there are two things that actually uh, it's evident right now. This we see when we work. Uh, one evidence is the if you use business platforms such as ServiceNow or whatever else. They are lagging behind, uh, obviously, the technology. Everyone is lagging behind the technology. You, you check every every day, every week, there's something new coming out, and you cannot be fast enough. And that's all right, because you need to have reliable and uh, like something dependable uh, implementation. But uh, at the same time, as I mentioned, competitors don't sleep, and uh, there are competitors do, that don't wait for the platforms to be uh, super fast and catching up a uh, year after with the feature that you need today. And uh, so what do we see? There's a lot of um, uh, a, a hybrid implementation approaches. So when you use some, you, you still use a platform, you still, let's say, use a service now and capabilities that it can give you uh, to solve your particular problem. But in reality, real world use cases are much more complex than just ticket summarization or something else. So you, so you, you shouldn't be concerned about uh, going hybrid so making use of what platforms that you are working uh, support and uh, do, doing something that helps your business that's what's what was important and then later or you can migrate to back to the platform but this is key because the fa the fast to the uh, to solve the, the speed with which you are solving is, is critical. Another interesting learning that we uh, we got is actually user experience matters in AI. Uh, it was funny when we released our first product uh, for the, uh, let's say, what, what I mentioned, um, for the uh, employee per perception, culture, understanding, and risk understanding. We, our first UI was a chat uh, interface, like mm -hmm. chat GPT, and no one could use that because uh, people, what we learned, especially enterprise, are 
uh, not really good at posing proper questions. They look at this this text bar is like, oh, okay, crazy. Uh, what should I ask? So uh, user experience is very important. And I would say uh, doing more like suggestions or actually getting rid of chat interfaces, but wrapping AI capabilities is something that user can grasp, understand, click uh, with one, like, and also be more, more familiar to the enterprise user is very important. And that uh, can also be the big differentiation between failure to adopt for adoption of that mm -hmm. tool that you built and success. And we've seen it firsthand. I see, I see. So basically, from what I see, uh, if you uh, in the in today's in yeah, uh, realm, if you want to be successful, you need to implement AI, whether you want it or not. Well, not an option. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that was very insightful, interesting conversation, and it's a quite, quite big topic to cover in one short webinar. That's why we are planning to do uh, to do more of them. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you, uh, you asked some questions during the webinar, so we are moving on to our QA session, and I already see um, one question constantly uh, repeating and actually i ask it myself as well uh, so the main concern people have with implementing ai is uh, data and uh, data data privacy and data leaks so um, guys uh, how how would you address these concerns to to our audience so this is probably the, the scariest thing yet to let your data to uh, some third-party AI uh, AI model. So uh, let Sorry, me okay, take that. Then, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, technology helps a lot. Um, when we talk about uh, ServiceNow, for example, ServiceNow has their internal uh, large language model. It's, mm -hmm. it's running in the data center of ServiceNow. So actually, you can avoid uh, data leaks and. Um, by, by using uh, ServiceNow LLM, uh, the data doesn't leave uh, ServiceNow data center. This is a big advantage. Still, you can use external uh, AI services. Uh, in that case, uh, you can filter out all personal identifiable information. So ServiceNow puts the placeholders and then puts them uh, back when uh, they receive the, the response. So there are some... Uh, tech-enabled um, risk, risk mitigations mm -hmm. around that. But of course, it's, a, uh, it's, it's your um, accountability as a platform owner or um, the, or the uh, service owner to maintain the data privacy uh, properly. OK, I see. Um, Alex, maybe you can, you can share your thoughts on, on that. So uh, again, kind of like for every concern on security on data privacy, there is a solution. And in the AI world, mm -hmm. so there are like like pure, from pure te technical perspective, first of all, if you're working with enterprise uh, ready uh, AI platforms, and if you if, like like Microsoft Azure uh, GPT uh, models, they 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 have clearly very mm -hmm. trustworthy, very very strict uh, privacy and, and guidelines. Um, uh, if you want to go deeper, you can always use uh, privately hosted uh, large language models. And actually, mm -hmm. for a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, mundane tasks, you don't need to have this huge, super uh, smart, uh, like GPT-4 level uh, and Gemini level uh, models. You can be doing, if you do routing, classification, summarization, you can do with, with that if you are really to value um, your privacy, you can you can run them in private, but uh, there are also solutions like guardrails and um, also wrappers around AI uh, calls that prevent you even if you build your fine tune model that prevent you uh, prevent attackers from accessing your internal data from that model. So there are so many ways to solve that, but I would say uh, oh, there is another use case that we, we we had with customer. We used a private AI model to obfuscate internal data before it went to the large language models outside the organization. So there's now this trick. So there are a lot of ways to solve that, but uh, I don't be, don't make that be a blocker uh, on achieving the business success. Be careful, be thoughtful, 
but there are so many ways it can be resolved without ex exposing the risks. There are more risk exposure on APIs integration or user interfaces in the in the legacy systems than right now uh, with, with the LLMs that you can use. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. And well, like I said, it's quite a big topic, but um, just as a, as a recap and just to sum up what we've talked about today, uh, folks, for you. So basically, if you want a successful Gen AI implementation in your uh, service management, what you should look for is, first of all, you need to define a specific goals and objectives, such as improving service efficiency or uh, reducing costs. Then you need to identify high impact use cases where Gen AI can deliver a significant value, such as um, like Alex said, automating repetitive tasks or improving incident resolution time or enhancing uh, predictive analysis. Then you need to foster collaboration between IT, business, and um, identify relevant data sources. You need to understand business requirements. And then you need to establish key performance indicators or KPIs to measure the performance and impact of Gen AI to maximize ROI and business value. And yeah, like AI is constantly evolving. So you need to build fast, you need to build flexibly, but you need to adapt quickly. So like a, uh, like a wise man said, with a great power comes great responsibility. So have fun with AI, like Costa said, but use it responsibly. So unfortunately, we've come to an end of our webinar slash discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. You've been a great audience. And thank you for this insightful webinar. It's been uh, quite an, an enriching experience, sharing ideas, learning together, and exploring new perspectives. As we come to an end of our time together, I want to express my deepest gratitude to our esteemed speakers, Alex, and Kostya, your expertise has illuminated our uh, discussion and we are going to continue our live session, but feel free to contact our experts if you want to make your business successful by implementing AI, Alex and Kostya and Teva system are here for you. Uh, I also want to extend my thanks to each and every one of you, our listeners, as we part way, let's stay connected, let's keep the conversation going, and let's continue to inspire one another. We are going to take part in uh, ServiceNow Knowledge Conference in May, so who knows, maybe we'll see each other there. So... Thank you once again for being part of this webinar, wishing you all continued success and fulfillment in your endeavors. Goodbye and until we meet again.